British Railways had been true to their word, and before long, a rake of ten shiny, blood and custard, Swindon built Mark I coaches were delivered to the railway. They were shunted into Stobra sidings by a deluded, senile British Railways loco. You know, this reminds me of the Great War. Jack spent most of that afternoon shunting them around the yard, getting them into the preferred formation, as instructed by the board of directors. Lorstavel was on hand to give Jack directions and explain what was going on. Right, Jack. It says here that we are to shunt the buffet car into the formation next. Yes, sir. Now, last but not least, there should be two first class coaches to add to the rake, and then we're done. Aha, this must be them. The two last remaining, and they have FK on them. What's that stand for? That stands for Corridor First. It's the classification of the coach. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. Also makes it easier for me to work out which is which. Exactly. Now, get those coaches coupled up to the rest of the rake, and you can pull them up to the signal at the end of the yard and back a few times. Myself and a couple of men from the carriage and wagon department will be walking along the train to check the brakes and the ride quality are satisfactory. Okay, sir. Jack shunted the final two coaches into the rake before he began to run up and down the yard with the coaches in tow. He was very impressed with how smoothly the coaches moved along and how responsive they were to his braking. These observations seem to be shared by Lord Sabell and his colleagues from the carriage and wagon department. Right, gentlemen, I think we're in agreement. Yes, your lordship, my tests have been quite conclusive. We're more than happy to allow these coaches into passenger service tomorrow, but we shall be riding on board to ensure that it all runs smoothly. I do say I'm glad to hear it. I shall catch up with you two tomorrow at the station. I'm travelling to Castle Stavell for a meeting with the board of directors. Very good, your lordship. We'll see you on the 0800 departure. Excellent. I shall bid you two gentlemen good day. Good day, your lordship. Lord Stavell walked away to prepare for his meeting the next day. The carriage and wagon workers instructed Jack to shunt the wreck towards the yard reception. One by one, as the engines returned from their day's work, they passed the new coaches. They were all excitedly talking about them when Ed finally returned after the last double flyer. I think they look quite good. Quite smart, really. I think it's great that BR are taking everything good about the Big Four's working practices and trying to make a standard fleet. Well, of the rolling stock, anyway. Not sure how long designs like myself have got left with the planned standard fleet of locomotives. Don't be ridiculous. If anybody has got anything to worry about, it's me. I'm old, worn out, and just ripe for the replacing. I wouldn't go so far as worn out, Arthur. I mean, after I saved you, Lord Stavell sent you for overhaul. You're practically a new engine underneath that facade you put on. That as may be, but I'm still beginning to feel my age now. My design is almost 40 years old. Lord Stavell would not get rid of you, and that is final. Your experience and knowledge is too important. That goes for you too, Vaughan. 
Besides, we don't even know if they're building a standard BR goods engine yet, do we? Anyway, back to the coaches. I found them really rather nice to shunt today. Really smooth running and surprisingly easy to control. You big engines would have no problem out on the proper railway. I'm not sure they look quite as good as they could though. Blood and custard paint scheme could have been swapped for something a little more refined. Says the blue king. <laughs> Touche. But seriously, I think the old Great Western chocolate and cream needs to be reintroduced. That was classy and stylish and very much refined. What about LMS Crimson? That would be rather nice. Yes, but chocolate and cream would be much more appropriate for the region, do you not think? Yeah, but don't forget half the fleet here are of Midland origin. It would be nice to have a reminder of home. Well, I'm going to withhold my real opinions until I've used them in passenger service. Oh, you won't have to wait very long. They're in service tomorrow. Lord Savelle and the carriage and wagon guys passed them fit for use this afternoon. Oh, joy of joys. Talking of Lord Savelle, why hasn't he come to tell us that news this evening? I overheard him this afternoon before he left talking about having to prepare for a board meeting or something tomorrow. He's probably got to make a report of his findings about these Mark 1s. Wouldn't surprise me. The board have been muscling in a lot recently. Poor Lord Savelle must be tearing his hair out. We know we're in safe hands though, don't we? He always has our best interests at heart. There was a murmur of agreement from the engines before one by one they started to drop off to sleep. All except Stuart, who had left to collect his mail consist shortly after Ed had finally stopped chatting and had fallen asleep. Early next morning, Ed was woken by his crew. They were checking him all over for any problems. Once they were satisfied, they climbed aboard. He was just about to pull away for the station when Stuart backed into the sheds. Morning, Ed. Good morning, my dear engine. Successful postal run, I take it? As always, no hiccups, no hold-ups, and clear signals all the way. Jolly good. I'd best be off. Don't want to be late for my first run with these new coaches. See you later, no doubts. Good luck. Ed steamed out of the sheds and backed into the up platform, where his rate of handsome crimson and cream coaches were waiting for him. Jack had been extremely busy already this morning, Ed thought to himself. With eight o'clock looming closer and closer, the final passengers hurriedly boarded, among them a flustered looking Lord Stavell. He climbed aboard the restaurant coach where breakfast was about to be served. Eight o'clock arrived and Ed made a prompt departure, pleasantly but secretly surprised at the smoothness of the Mark 1s trailing behind him. He was soon stopping at Castle Stavell, the only time during the day that the Stubble Flyer called here. He was a tad worried when Lord Stavell scuttled out of the train without even a backward glance at him and very quickly left the station. That's odd, he usually at least comes to say good morning. Ed mulled this weird behaviour over as he continued to work during the day. The following few days were exactly the same as the first. No morning brief at the sheds, no greeting when he boarded the train at Stobra, and no goodbye at Castle Stavell. Not even an evening debrief. It all came to a head in the sheds that Friday evening. I just don't know what could be going on. He has been notably absent from the railway all week. Maybe his favourite character from Over the Pills has finally popped his clogs. 
Prescription drugs are a real killer these days. Don't be so vulgar and insensitive. Oh, is that the original series or the reboot? Oh, you know the original series was never completed. Maybe the board really are giving him a grilling over these new coaches. How have they been this week, Ed? Well, I can really say I'm a changed engine after a week's worth of use out of them. My opinion of them has skyrocketed. Smooth running, responsive brakes, and to make it even better, the passengers have been commenting on how the carmine and cream of the coaches suits my blue livery very well. Not to mention the food from the buffet coach, which smells simply divine. Wow, you really are a changed engine. So if Lord Savelle is getting a grilling in regards to these new coaches, it definitely can't be negative feedback. You know what? I wouldn't bet on it being anything related to rolling stock. Their conversation was interrupted by the surprise arrival of Lord Stavell. Good evening, sir. Good evening, engines. Uh, just a quick one. Arthur, Vaughan, can you please make your way to Fort Stoma's sheds immediately, please? Yes, sir. What would this be in aid of? It will be explained when you arrive at Fort Stomoth. Now, off you go. Lord Stavell disappeared once more as Arthur and Vaughan left for Fort Stomoth. Once they were gone, the rest of the engine started to deliberate. New coaches arrive, Lord Stavell starts acting weirdly, and now Arthur and Vaughan have been summoned to Fort Stomoth without so much as an explanation. This week just gets weirder and weirder. Arthur and Vaughan were absent for all of Saturday. They weren't even waiting in the shed on Sunday morning when the other engines awoke. It was only when they returned to the shed from Sunday's duties in the early evening that they found Arthur and Vaughan waiting for them. Both of them looked exhausted but triumphant. Lord Savell arrived ten minutes later in his car. Good evening, engines. I trust you have had a good week. Now, you may have been wondering why I've been acting so weird recently. Well, weirder than normal, sir. Very true, Stan. But seriously, the board of directors, Arthur, Vaughan, and I, have a very special announcement to make. As of tomorrow, we should be running services along the Fort Stomoth extension. This means the first run of the Stomoth Seaside Express. And, to commemorate this occasion, the board have made their decisions on the two engines that will run it. Arthur and Vaughan looked at each other, pride beginning to well up in their smoke boxes. Now, they aren't the two I personally would have picked for the inaugural run, but there you are, the board's decision is final. The looks of pride vanished from Arthur and Vaughan's faces and joined the rest of the engine's confused expressions. It has been decided that Stan will take the outward leg from Retford to Stomoth, whilst Ed will take the return back to Retford later in the day. But that's not fair! That's right, Vaughan and I put a lot of hard work into that extension. We deserve to pull the train. I know you two, I know it but the board feel it's more appropriate for our two largest passenger locos to take the train as a show of power, speed and style. I tried to persuade them otherwise, but they wouldn't have it. This is ridiculous. The board sends us orders to work non-stop over the weekend and then doesn't even reward us with the honour of being the first to haul the express over the line. What a way to ruin morale. Believe me, if I could change their minds, I absolutely would, but they have insisted and their word is final, unfortunately. I'll be speaking with my union rep about this. I... I'm your union rep. Now, bugger off. Now, now, please, let's not get frosty with one another. What is decided is decided, but I shall endeavour to make it up to you. Some final points of order. Earl, you'll be in charge of the Starwell Flyer tomorrow to allow Ed and Stan to run this special service. Everyone else should be working as normal. Once again, Arthur and Vaughan, I'm extremely sorry. Lord Stavell walked off in the direction of the nearest pub, his mind firmly set on a beer or two. I'm in charge of the Stavell Flyer? Me? Oh my goodness. Shut up, there's more important things to discuss. I can't believe they made us do all that work over the weekend and then suddenly decide we're not going to pull the train. Ed and Stan stayed deathly quiet for the rest of the night. The frosty atmosphere was still lingering in the morning when Stan departed to collect the Mark 1 coaches from the siding. He had to take the empty stock to Retford where his journey to Fort Stamon would begin. He was soon racing through the open countryside.
It was so early in the morning that as he passed through Wantage, Stuart was still standing in the platform delivering mail. He arrived into Retford where he deposited the coaches in the head shunt and disappeared to the sheds to fill up with coal and water. He arrived to an empty complex. All apart from one mainline engine he didn't recognise who was currently occupying the coal tower. He was the same shape as Ed, but he was green. Good morning, stranger. Hello there. What brings you to Retford, then? I brought a trainload of railway officials down from London last night. Apparently there's some special occasion here today. Yeah, there is. We're opening an extension to the port at Fort Stamouth. Nice to see railways are expanding here. Good for you. You don't happen to have an engine here called King Edward V. Ed? Yeah, he's up at the main shed complex in Stobra. Won't be down this way till this evening. Oh, that's a shame. I was hoping that he'd be here. I wanted to have a word with him. Well, I can pass him a message if you want. Oh, would you? That's very kind. Just tell him William III says hello and I wish him all the best. I never got the chance to see him before he was transferred here. Got that. I'll pass it on. The king smiled and finished coaling up before he departed towards the junction. Stan finally coaled up and filled with water before he too headed towards the junction. He passed through the station where a large group of people were gathered. Among them was Lord Stavell, Mr Turpin and the rest of the board. He dragged the coaches into the platform and the passengers boarded. Lord Stavell approached him. Please do us proud, Stan. We're going to be watching with great interest. You'll really enjoy the run to Fort Stonemouth, it's breathtaking. I really hope I proved to the board I was the right choice for this run, sir. I hope you do too, but please remember Arthur and Vaughan and the amount of work they have put into the line. They practically built the railway between them. Lord Savelle walked back towards the train and joined the rest of the board of directors in the buffet car where a full silver service was being prepared for them. Stan felt a tinge of guilt but this was soon blown way out of his smoke box when he heard the guards whistle and he began his journey. He thundered out of Retford making sure he put on a good show for his passengers. The Mark 1s rolled smoothly along behind him and he made excellent time. He arrived into Stobra right on time with no problems whatsoever. He was simmering happily waiting for his departure when Jack pulled the old express stock into the opposite platform. Oh hello Stan, how's it going? It's amazing Jack, I'm really impressed with these coaches, they're excellent. Hope Ed doesn't hog them. He'll have more to worry about when you return to the sheds later on. Arthur and Vaughan are still fuming. I've got no time to worry about those two. I'm too busy to worry about them and their petty grudges. <whistles> Just you watch this. I'll give Ed a run for his money. Stan's smug look was wiped off his smoke box when he found he couldn't release his brakes. He tried and tried, but as much as he put the effort in, he just couldn't release them. So, uh, what am I supposed to be watching? Shut up. I can't create enough vacuum to release the brakes. Oh, not good. Seems like there'll be a leak somewhere. Is there anything I can help with, gentlemen? We've got a leak in the vacuum pipe somewhere, your lordship. Right, I suggest we walk down the train and check the pipes for damage. Let's start at the back. The three men walked to the rear of the train and checked the entire rake of coaches for damage. However, there was no apparent damage. Well, I don't know. I'm really rather confused. Aha, uh -huh, I found it. There's a huge tear in the vacuum pipe on Stan's tender here. Well, there we are, gentlemen. Well done. 
No time to take Stan off. I've got the perfect replacement, however. Lord Savelle briskly walked to the sheds where Arthur and Vaughan were stood waiting. He approached them as they were still irritably talking about the board's decision. Oh, here we go. Time to get the lowdown on how well Stan is pulling the train. Well, actually, we need your help. Stan has damage to his vacuum pipe, therefore he can't release his brakes to get the train moving. I feel it would be appropriate for you two to take the train onwards. Well, um, I, I say, I lead the way. The two engines turned on the turntable and headed towards the station. They showed no mercy to Stan who kept deathly quiet as they coupled up to the train. So, Mr. Union Rep, seems like we got our way eventually. Don't worry, we'll only remind you of this a lot. Jack, who had seen all, was still sat in the platform opposite, and wished the two engines good luck as the cavalcade departed the station. They raced through the stunning countryside, marvelling at the views that they'd missed whilst concentrating on building the railway. Viaducts and tunnels, mountains and lakes, it was a beautiful sight made all the sweeter by the situation. They finally slowed and crossed the Stonemouth Bridge at the mouth of the River Stow. before they finally arrived into Fort Stonemouth Station. They had made up plenty of time and Lord Savelle and the board rather sheepishly congratulated them on saving the day. Arthur and Vaughan shunted Stan into the shed where Ed was waiting to take the train later in the afternoon. Arthur and Vaughan were called to the station where Lord Savelle was waiting to make a speech. Aha! The engines of the moment. Directors of the board, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present Arthur and Vaughan, the two locomotives of my fleet who have almost single-handedly built this railway and the two engines that saved the day when disaster struck this morning. Arthur and Vaughan here have been collecting raw materials and workmen and distributing them along the length of this extension to ensure the line was open as quickly, efficiently and as cost-effectively as possible. And when duty called this past weekend, they showed real dedication as they worked tirelessly around the clock to complete the final preparations for the opening today. 
We are indebted to them both, and I hope that certain events of today have more than made up for any wrongdoing myself and the board may have put upon you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, the prides of the railway, Arthur and Vaughan. The crowd burst into applause, Lost of clapping the loudest. After what felt like five minutes, Lost of silenced the crowd and continued his speech. As lord of this glorious vale we call home, I have always had the vision of bringing us well and truly into the modern age, and now, many, many years after the railway should have arrived, it has come. The Stovall Valley in its entirety is connected to the rest of the UK from the north, and now, the rest of the world from the south. I am extremely proud to announce the Fort Stomouth extension, open. More applause followed this, and the crowd dispersed as the festivities begun. The railway had rented a grand hotel that overlooked the station and the engine shed. This was where everyone gathered. And whilst the party got underway, Arthur and Vaughan made their way back to the sheds where Stan was arguing with his driver. Of all the incompetent crews I've had, you two take the biscuit. I'll be contacting my union rep. You are your union rep. All right, come to gloat, have we? Not exactly. I actually feel sorry for you, really. However funny it might be. Stan's fireman emerged from round the back of his tender. I fixed it. I found a spare pipe at the back of the shed. We're all good again. Are you bloody kidding me? The engines laughed and begun conversing about the day's events. Arthur, Vaughan and Stan made amends and Stan could even laugh about his misfortune. Later in the afternoon, Ed bustled away to take the return portion of the express. The coaches were full with dignitaries who were just about ready to take a nap. About half an hour later, Stan perked up. Arthur, I'll take your freight train from the docks. I need to test my new vacuum pipe, and I should probably do something to make amends. That's jolly kind of you, Stan. Oh, it's the least I can do. And also, it's in my interest as your union rep to ensure you're well provided for. Oh, shut up about the bloody union. If you do, I might even bank you up to Fulbrook. Oh, alright, come on then. The two engines left Arthur to the relative peace and quiet of the empty sheds. The only noise now was the steady exhaust beats of Vaughan and Stan as they made their way to the docks, and the quiet sound of the sea lapping against the shore. Presently, after ten minutes of silence, Arthur could hear the loud, steady beats of the two engines working hard as they slogged up the bank, out of Stomoth, way off in the distance. Comforted by this familiar sound, he soon found himself falling asleep in the warm seaside sun.